morning and welcome to the 2009 Orientare Lumen Congress on monasticism. As you know, monasticism in the Eastern tradition is used as a code word for what in general we would refer to as religious life and as the ideal of Christian spiritual life for everyone. Monasticism basically means the life with God. And I would like to discuss with you today a topic without which there is no life with God, the topic of prayer. In Luke 11, verse 1, we read that the disciples, seeing Jesus praying, asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. The kinds of prayer are many, but in this first reflection I am talking about what is usually called private prayer, though of course no prayer is private in the sense of being done alone, since it wells up from the Spirit of God who dwells within us, St. Paul tells us. Furthermore, our prayer is always done in company with the communion of saints to which we belong by baptism. As with everything else in the spiritual life, Jesus is the model of our prayer. How did Jesus pray? He prayed liturgically, for the New Testament presents him participating in the Jewish festivals, in the cult of the Jerusalem temple, and in the synagogue, that is to say, in the Jewish liturgy of his day. More important for this opening reflection of our conference, we also see Jesus praying privately and therefore implicitly teaching us how to pray indirectly, by example. Jesus prays in solitude, especially when conflicted and distressed, as in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying for comfort and relief in his sorrow. He prays to the Father in blessing, adoration, praise, glorification, thanksgiving, petition and intercession, he prays the wonderful prayer of farewell to his disciples in chapter 17 of the Gospel of John. He prays in anguish at the hour of his death on the cross. When asked directly how to pray, Jesus teaches his disciples the Our Father as the ideal model. He also instructs them to pray without making a show of it, but quietly, humbly, and in the Spirit not with long prayers in public like the Pharisees, but in solitude, using few words, humbly asking forgiveness like the publican. Jesus tells us to pray persistently, even obstinately, pestering God until he gives us what we want just to get rid of us. And we see Jesus' own example praying in the morning, in the evening, keeping night vigils, and exhorting his disciples to do the same, telling them to watch and pray, for we know not the day nor the hour. Jesus also teaches us to pray always and not to lose heart, to pray with faith and confidence, because he assures us our prayers will be answered, though of course not necessarily in the way we want. For as we pray in the prayer of the third antiphon of the Byzantine Divine Liturgy, fulfill now the requests of your servants in all things good for us. So Jesus shows us that there is nothing for which we cannot pray except sin. He teaches us prayer of petition and thanks and sorrow and pardon and importunity and even complaint. And this prayer is both Christian and Trinitarian. One can pray to the Father in Jesus' name, one can pray to Jesus directly, and one can pray to the Holy Spirit as in the Byzantine Heavenly King Consolo Spirit of Truth Troparion, or the Latin prayer, Come Holy Spirit. Christian prayer is also Marian prayer, for we imitate the fiat of Luke 1.38 and the Magnificat, Luke 1.46-55, of the Theotokos, and constantly invoke her intercession. As to when we should pray, Jesus commands us to pray always, an injunction repeated several times in the New Testament. And from the start, beginning with the New Testament itself, we see the first Christians following Jesus' example of prayer. 
From then on, the fathers and mothers of the apostolic churches of East and West, right up to the spiritual fathers and mothers of today, maintain this teaching and follow this example. But what is prayer? How do these spiritual guides define or describe prayer? What in their view does it mean to pray? St. John Damascene, last of the Greek fathers, wrote in his classic treatise on the Orthodox faith that prayer is the raising of one's mind and heart to God, or the requesting of good things from God. More recently, St. Teresa of Lisieux, the little flower, surely one of the most beloved saints of the 20th century, dear to Christians of both East and West, said more simply, in more directly feminine terms, for me prayer is a surge of the heart. It is a simple look turned toward heaven. It is a cry of recognition and of love, embracing both trial and joy. So prayer is always a turning toward God in any one or all of the multiple ways it has given us to do that, in words or without, in thought, in love, in anguish or sorrow, in joy or desperation, in thanks or complaint. There are no limits to it, and there is no definition that can exhaust its fullness, for its ways are myriad. Prayer is talking, but also listening. Prayer is asking, but also receiving. For prayer is not our gift to God, but his to us in the Spirit, the paraclete or comforter he has sent to be with us always. For a more full and technical modern definition of prayer, we find the following in the excellent catechism of the Catholic Church, which, which tells us that Christian prayer is a covenant relationship between God and man in Christ. It is the action of God and man springing forth from both the Holy Spirit and ourselves, wholly directed to the Father in union with the human will of the Son of God made man. In the New Covenant, prayer is the living relationship of the children of God with their Father, who is good beyond measure, with His Son Jesus Christ, and with the Holy Spirit. The grace of the Kingdom is the union of the entire Holy and Royal Trinity with the whole human spirit. Thus the life of prayer is the habit of being in the presence of the thrice holy God and in communion with Him. This communion of life is always possible because through baptism we have already been united with Christ. Prayer is Christian insofar as it is communion with Christ and extends throughout the Church, which is His body. Its dimensions are those of Christ's love. Spiritual writers describe many ways of prayer, some of them overlapping and more or less synonymous. There is liturgical prayer, vocal prayer, mental prayer, meditation, contemplation, Lexio Divina, Hesychia, or the Prayer of Quiet, as it was called in the West. Some of these terms are open to misunderstanding, however. Mental prayer or meditation, for instance, might be mistaken for just thinking or reflecting, which in itself is not prayer at all. And some spiritual writers devalue vocal prayer as if it were second-rate, considered just words recited by rote, with no necessary interiority. Indeed, there have been times in the history of the Church when even liturgical prayer was looked on much in the same way and considered secondary to contemplation or interior prayer. The truth of the matter, however, is that most methods of prayer include all or at least several of the many ways of prayer. One contemplates an icon, meditates on a psalm or other spiritual text or spiritual topic. Reflection on this holy icon or divine word moves one's heart and inspires one to speak to God about what is on one's mind and in one's heart, and then to listen attentively for the response of His grace. The same with vocal prayer, or the prayer called Lectio Divina, spiritual reading in the ancient tradition of Western monasticism. It is not just spiritual reading of some pious text, but a slow, prayerful, meditative reading during which one pauses as the heart is moved to ponder and speak to God of what has moved one's spirit. This is the same as the classic second method of prayer of St. Ignatius of Loyola's spiritual exercises. And St. Jean-Baptiste Marie Vianney, better known as the Curé d'Ars, 
recounts how one of his French peasant parishioners called contemplation a gaze of faith, a communion of love. When asked to describe his prayer before the tabernacle, he said, I look at Jesus and he looks at me. All these ways of prayer are found, if under different names, in the classical Eastern and Western spiritual writers. One of my favorites is 19th century Russian Orthodox Bishop St. Feofan Zadvornik, or Theophan the Recluse, a spiritual master who lived from 1815 to 1894. Ordained a bishop in 1860, after six years he resigned and retired to a small monastery to live a life of prayer and seclusion. Feofan, who calls prayer standing before God with the mind in the heart, distinguishes three degrees of prayer, bodily or vocal prayer, prayer of the mind, and prayer of the heart, or prayer of the mind in the heart. Oral or vocal prayers, Feofan teaches, in an insight of genius, originated as purely spiritual prayers that only later became oral by being written down. When we pray them now, we must reverse the process, he writes, and enter into the spirit of the prayers which you hear and read, reproducing them in your heart, and in this way offer them up from your heart to God, as if they had been born in your own heart under the action of the grace of the Holy Spirit. Then and then alone is the prayer pleasing to God. How can we attain such a prayer? Ponder carefully on the prayers which you have to read in your prayer book. Feel them deeply, even learn them by heart, and so when you pray you will express that which is already deeply felt in your heart. The same is true of the liturgical chants. Citing the teaching of St. John Chrysostom, St. Feofan says, the songs must primarily be spiritually and sung not only by the tongue, but also by the heart. By the continual practice of this prayer with the mind and the heart, one's prayer becomes spiritualized and takes on a life of its own, becoming self-moving, as St. Feofan calls it, when prayer exists and acts on its own. That is to say, is moved by the grace of the Spirit and not by one's own human will. Slowly, words disappear from the prayer, which becomes the heart's wordless, unceasing prayer of love. There is nothing whatever in this description of progress in interior prayer that is foreign to Western spirituality, despite the frantic attempts of the cliché mongers to seek everywhere irreconcilable differences between East and West. The early Hesychists also evolved a physical method, a method of bodily posture and breathing techniques to foster this state of prayer, and there is something akin to it in the third method of prayer in St. Ignatius Loyola's spiritual exercises. But Fairfan and other authoritative 19th century Russian masters, like Bishop Ignacy Branchaninov, were somewhat reticent with regard to this physical method. Basically, what these authors, East and West, are talking about is what I call the interiorizing of vocal and liturgical prayer, taking the written text and making it one's own by praying it in one's heart, so that when one returns to it again and again, it is no longer someone else's prayer, but has become the movement of one's own heart. This is the type of prayer that I like to recommend to those who have so much to do that they cannot themsel devote themselves totally to a life of prayer like a monastic hermit living in his skeet. I call it the prayer of the busy person, a way of prayer suitable for monastics as well as non-monastic priests and others busily engaged in the pastoral ministry, for those distracted by the cares of administering a parish perhaps, while at the same time bringing up and supporting a family. This sort of life is very much like the one I live as a Jesuit, and this is the sort of prayer I have learned to do amidst the hectic cares of my work. Though vowed to the monastic ideal in the Eastern sense of the educated monks of orthodoxy engaged in the work of the Church, Jesuits lead a busy, active life in the world. The underlying Ignatian or Jesuit vision of this world, inherited from our founder St. Ignatius of Loyola, is that only God can save it, 
but that he has chosen to use us as instruments in so doing. One of my favorite prayers, that of St. Teresa of Avila, a contemporary of St. Ignatius in the 16th century, expresses this vision perfectly. The prayer says, Christ has no body now but yours, no hands but yours, no feet but yours. Yours are the eyes through which Christ's compassion must look out on the world. Yours are the feet with which he is to go about doing good. Yours are the hands with which he is to bless us now. The same vision is expressed in the Byzantine liturgical tradition by the feasts known as the Synaxis in Greek or Sabor in Slavonic, which fall in the liturgical calendar on the day following a major feast of salvation history. They celebrate the role of those human figures intimately associated with the saving mystery of the preceding day. Mary's parents, Saints Joachim and Anne on September 9th, the day after the nativity of the Theotokos. Mary the mother of God on December 26th, the day after the nativity of her divine son. John the Baptist on January 7th, the day after the theophany and baptism of Jesus. All indicate the same doctrine of our faith that by entering our human history through the incarnation of his divine Son, God willed to associate us in his work of salvation. That's what we call the Church. The Church is the body of those who are associated with God in his work of salvation. This vision, equally Ignatian and Byzantine, is fundamentally different from the modern humanistic and secular social ideal which pretends that humans can of themselves create the society they choose, free of human despotism, historical determinism, and supernatural authority. But it is equally different from the ideal of early and eastern monasticism with its radical eschatological orientation and rejection of this world. On the contrary, Ignatian service and prayer, in the words of Jesuit Karl Rahner, whom many consider the greatest Catholic theologian of the 20th century, is rooted in a positive, amicable, and joyous relationship with the world. As the former Jesuit Father General Peter Hans Kolvenbach noted, Ignatian spirituality does not insist on seeking God outside of created things, but rather finding Him in them and recognizing fully their autonomous existence in a state of dependence as created objects. The condition of this cooperation in God's design for the human race, however, is that we, the human instruments, be united with God. And that is where prayer comes in. Without prayer there is no such thing as a spiritual life, no possibility of being united with God, no chance of being His instrument in the salvation of the world. And I might add, no chance of living a happy and fulfilled religious or Christian life. For without prayer we are not living in and with God, and that is the monastic ideal which in the Eastern tradition is considered the ideal of all. Monasticism and Christian life is the life with God. As the Catechism of the Catholic Church states peremptorily, prayer is a vital necessity. Prayer and Christian life are inseparable. Immersed in this world, we need the Bless This Mess spirituality, so aptly expressed by Michael Hollings, the harried, overworked urban parish priest of St. Mary of the Angels in Bayswater, London, in an article in the April 29, 1988 London Tablet. Describing his years of study in Rome, Father Hollings recalls Bobby Dyson, a Byzantine Rite Jesuit I had the privilege of meeting and serving as cantor and his divine liturgy during my first visit to Rome in May 1959 on my way back to the United States from my years of teaching in Baghdad, Iraq in the 1950s when I stayed at the Biblical Institute where Father Dyson was professor. Hollings describes how in Rome the most memorable lecturer was a Jesuit, Father Dyson of the Biblical Institute. In four years of scripture lectures we covered almost everything under heaven without ever moving beyond the first three chapters of Genesis. One phrase has always remained in my mind from Father Dyson's teaching about creation. 
the Hebrew for the early state of the earth was tohu and bohu, trackless waste and emptiness. Since I began to think and pray seriously, I have come to realize that tohu and bohu was not only the situation at the dawn of the world, but continues where I stand today. It is upon this formless mass, this mess, that God works. This so resonated with the way my life sometimes seems that I have saved that clipping these 24 years and still derive wry consolation from it every time I read it. The active life of a minister in today's church is tohu and bohu indeed, but we can give it form and shape through our prayer. What then does my experience recommend as ways of prayer for the busy worker in God's vineyard? First, a few simple but ironclad principles for a life of prayer. One, lead a regular life. Two, keep the method of prayer simple. Three, give your prayer a framework. Fourth, prepare for your prayer. Fifth, keep at it no matter what. First, lead a regular life. Any life, and especially any spiritual life, needs a rule of life. It's pravila. For without regularity, prayer is usually the first thing that falls by the wayside. A Jesuit superior general once wrote that half the problems our Jesuit men have with prayer would disappear if they would just learn to go to bed on time. I say amen to that, since it has also been my own experience. So set yourself a schedule for retiring and rising, except on special days, days off, holidays, whatever, days when church services or other duties may force changes in the usual schedule, and then stick to it. Second, keep the method of prayer simple. In a moment I shall suggest some very basic, tried and proven traditional methods of prayer. I strongly suggest not getting involved in complicated, convoluted methods involving all sorts of mental gymnastics or physical exercises. Third, prepare for prayer. It is a great assist to prayer if one takes a few minutes the night before to prepare the material for the next morning's prayer, to choose the scriptural text, the psalm, the icon, the theme, the prayer text, whatever, whatever one wishes to use as the springboard of the next day's prayer. For example, maybe one is going through the Divine Liturgy day after day, reflecting on and interiorizing each of its prayer texts. If so, read over the prayer for the next day. Or perhaps one is praying one's way through one of the Gospels, chapter by chapter. If so, read over the upcoming chapter the night before. Fourth, give your prayer a framework. This means having a more or less set way to begin your prayer when the circumstances allow it. A minimum framework might comprise, for example, rec recollecting oneself in silence for a moment, recognizing that one is always in the presence of God. Some spiritual writers call this putting oneself in the presence of God, but of course it is God who has put us in his holy presence for always. It is we who have to bring that reality to our consciousness with an act of faith and adoration. Then make a great metony of Veliki Poklon, that is to say, a bow right down to the floor, and recite the Polnia Nachala, or the full beginning of our Byzantine offices, if you belong to that tradition, beginning with Blessed is our God, up to the triple, O come let us worship and bow down. In other words, the traditional beginning that opens all of our offices. And then focus on the matter of our prayer by asking God what we specifically hope to receive from Him as the grace or fruit of the day and its prayer. Fifth, keep at it no matter what. There are many obstacles to prayer, overwork, fatigue, anger, depression, discouragement, distraction, temptation, sin. I shall talk about some of these problems shortly but we should never let them interfere with or destroy our life of prayer. For let me repeat, without prayer there is no Christian spiritual life. What 
are some ways of prayer that might be useful for the busy worker in God's vineyard or for the person with so many occupations and so many trials in life that really life is one ongoing distraction making prayer somewhat difficult. What follows deals not with the theory of daily prayer but with its practice and is largely based on my personal experience in an area for which I claim no special expertise and certainly no infallibility. My own experience of what the spiritual literature euphemistically calls spiritual direction has often been negative, and I have no romantic views of my own competence in the process. Furthermore, what appears to me as little better than the tyranny exercised today by spiritual fathers or mothers and confessors in some Eastern Christian traditions who arrogate to themselves the right to refuse people access to Holy Communion is for our times, in my view, an intolerable violation of freedom of conscience. That said, for what it's worth, here are some of my views on the prayer of the busy Christian actively engaged in ministry or in other activities in today's hectic world. First, Lexio Divina. The first way of prayer I recommend is the classic monastic method St. Feofan Zadvorny calls prayer of the mind that leads to the spiritually pure prayer of the mind and the heart, a method similar to what is called in the West Lexio Divina. This consists of placing oneself before God and reading a text of scripture, a psalm, a prayer, a traparion, the apophthegmata, or sayings of the fathers, indeed any spiritual or liturgical text, internalizing it, talking to God about it, and listening in the quiet of one's heart to what he has to say. I find the Psalms ideal for this sort of prayer, and one can do the same contemplating an icon or almost any other religious object that moves one to prayer. Second, interiorizing prayer. What I call interiorizing prayer, a method most useful for sacred ministers whose life is taken up with celebrating the sacred mysteries of the Church, applies this Lexio Divina to liturgical texts. By ruminating prayerfully on the prayers of the Divine Liturgy or other mysteries, one learns to interiorize and intensify one's liturgical life and ministry, making it not only the prayer of the Church, but also one's own. This is a prayer that is not restricted only to sacred ministers of the sacraments, but can be used by those who receive them also. Third, distracted prayer. The perhaps infelicitous name distracted prayer, or prayer of distraction, is of my own coining. Contrary to what the spiritual guides tell us to do, I have found it impossible to banish distractions from prayer, and long ago concluded it is useless to try. Rather, I simply fold them into my prayer, making them the subject of my conversation with God, telling Him I am a poor sinner, unable to think of Him for two minutes without my mind wandering, perhaps having doubts of faith, even erotic thoughts and temptations, asking Him to be with me even in my smallness, my sinfulness, my inadequacy. Fourth, prayer anywhere. Prayer anywhere means just what it says. Prayer wherever we find ourselves. Prayer while walking on the sidewalk. Prayer while shopping in the supermarket. Prayer on a train or plane or bus. Prayer in the subway. Prayer wherever. Here too one cannot help but be distracted. Distracted by the crowds. Distracted by attractive women. Distracted by wackos and pests. Turned off by the nuisance of beggars or the homeless. Well, my solution is just to pray for them, all of them, together or individually. I place them in God's hands. I ask Him to bring the unbelievers and unevangelized to faith in Him and to hope in His divine mercy, to bring the unbaptized and unchurched to the saving waters of baptism, to give those in sin His saving grace of conversion and repentance. I ask Him to heal the sick and the aged, to comfort the sad and lonely, I thank him for my health of mind and spirit, for the fact that I have many friends to be with me, that I do not have to worry about food and shelter and medical care and the other necessities of life. 
This kind of prayer anywhere is perfectly Eastern and traditional. As St. John Chrysostom says in his selection on prayer number two, it is possible to offer fervent prayer even while walking in public or strolling alone or seated in your shop or buying or selling or even while cooking. All I have done is given a modern spin. Fifth, the Jesus Prayer. The Jesus Prayer, a tradition that lies at the very heart of Orthodox spirituality, is also a prayer for everywhere. St. Simeon of Thessalonica, who died in 1429, says this of the holy and deifying Jesus Prayer in chapter 297 of his treatise on divine prayer that has been incorporated into the Philokalia. He says, pray this name always as a prayer with the intellect and with the tongue, whether standing still or walking, whether sitting or lying down, while saying or doing whatever, always striving to do this. The Jesus Prayer is in some ways the prayer that would become characteristic of interior prayer in Byzantine Orthodox spirituality. Rooted in the scriptures, it is composed of two elements from the Gospels. The prayer of the blind man in Luke 18, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, and the prayer of the publican in Luke 18, verse 13, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Rooted in the Old Testament reverence for the divine name, the Jesus prayer also finds justification and explanation in several New Testament texts that glorify the name of Jesus and calling out that name in prayer, as in Matthew 1, John 16, Acts 4, Philippians 2, 1 Corinthians 12, and so on. This Jesus prayer is another of my favorite ways of prayer, not only because it works anywhere, but because it is a prayer for forgiveness of which I am always in need, and because it is an ideal prayer for those many times when one is overworked, harassed, tired, upset, feeling low, with no energy for anything else but the comforting Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Repeating it over and over again, counting off the pet petitions on the, on the Chotki, the rosary-like Byzantine prayer chord, it coordinates with one's breathing and gradually takes off by itself, eventually becoming reduced to Jesus' mercy with each breath. Sixth, prayer when in sin. The Jesus prayer is a prayer of sinners, which we all are, and of which I am the first, as we say in the prayer before Holy Communion. There are times when we feel guilty of serious sin, of having lost God's friendship and grace, of having willingly expelled the Holy Spirit who is dwelling in the temple of our soul. This is a dangerous time for prayer, for we may feel unworthy to approach God even in prayer, that would be a grave mistake, for it is precisely in the fire of prayer that our sins are burned away by the divine compassion and love, and <coughs> we are returned to grace. Perhaps we do not yet have the courage to go to confession. Well, talk to God about your sin. Tell Him you fear His wrath, are even afraid to go to confession. Explain to Him what happened. Of course, He already knows it better than we do, but no matter. Give him your point of view. Tell him how you see it. Whatever. But above all, pray. Pray and you will feel his loving forgiveness and call to penitence. Enter and warm your heart and cleanse away your sin, making you ready for the grace of the mystery of confession. And let your own sinfulness, if you are a priest or someone studying for the priesthood, be for you the best lesson on how you must act as confessor and spiritual father, never bringing harshness or judgment or the curiosity of unnecessary questioning to your ministry, but only the love and peace of Christ who was crucified not only for your penitent sins, but also for yours. Seventh, praying forward to open the day. At the beginning of the day we are often preoccupied about what the day will bring how we will be able to manage the many tasks on our agenda. This is a time to pray forward, as I call it, a sort of spiritual gearing up for the day ahead. The normal material of the daily prayer of the busy servant of God is often the issues we are facing day by day. 
First of all, we should know what we want to ask for in this prayer. It quod volo, what I want, as St. Ignatius Loyola calls it. The aim of the prayer is just to be with God. But we must focus, must know what we want from Him this day. As we move into our prayer, we review the day ahead, ask God's help in what we foresee. Where will we need Him especially today? What specifically do we ask of the Lord this day? Then begin the Lectio Divina of the material chosen for your prayer, and read until something slows you down. If nothing seems to work, just settle into God, and let the day float by, and be with Him in reviewing it. Bring to Him the things on your mind, and test your feelings and reactions to them against His presence, and ask for His help in all. Eighth, praying backwards to close the day. At the end of the day, do the same thing in reverse. This is the awareness examine, or consciousness examine, as St. Ignatius' general examination of con conscience is now more subtly called. After praying for the grace of God's illumination, in repentance and thanksgiving, we review the events and feelings, both positive and negative, that surface in our replay of the day. We pray over them in thanks and or sorrow, and look forward to tomorrow and God's help for its tasks and problems. Ninth, the prayer of thankful love. A longer, more substantial prayer of the same sort is my simplified version of St. Ignatius's contemplation to attain the love of God in his spiritual exercises, Numbers 230 to 237. It too is an easy prayer when one is tired and discouraged and without much energy, a prayer of great consolation and grace. I just review my whole life from the start, see God's guiding hand through it all, and let my love and gratitude for his providential care well up into prayer of loving thanks. I thank him that he brought me into being, that I was born in a free country to a family of fervent Catholics who had me baptized and raised me in the love of the Church and of our Christian faith and practice rather than to atheistic or non-Christian parents. I thank him for the Catholic education I received at home and from the Christian brothers in high school, for my vocation and the grace to persevere in it. I thank him for my friends who have loved and supported me. And I ask him to forgive my failings, my infidelities to them and to him, and especially my many sins. This is what I would recommend in general as the ways in which one can very simply but truly pray. Because as I said before, prayer is the very foundation of the life with God. Monastic life, the life of all Christians, means the life with God. And without prayer, there is no such life. Thank you for your attention.